What's happening, bro chachis? Today is Thursday, or Friday's Eve, as I fondly refer to it. And if you've been keeping up with the news, you've seen that the governor of California has said that Friday will be the day that a lot of the laws will be lifted so that we can start slowly going back outside. So that's great news for two reasons. Number one, the weather is absolutely beautiful. And number two, you're gonna be able to go and ride your bikes in said beautiful weather. But you know what the most beautiful thing of all is? That like button, so you better smash it. But on a more lighter note, we're gonna be talking about bikes and weight differences. See what I did there? And today we're gonna to be comparing this 2020 Kink Curb versus my 2020 Shadow Conspiracy and Sabrosa brand custom build. To the untrained eye, both of these bikes look exactly the same. You have BMX bikes with some brakes, some tires, one of them has pegs and one doesn't. But to the untrained eye, which we'll be opening up today, I'm gonna to go over all the differences that make this a $2,000 bike and this a $200 bike. Before we jump right into this, I wanna add that I am not sponsored by Kink Bikes, but I am sponsored by Shadow Conspiracy and Sabrosa, but I have not been paid by either one of these companies to make this video. I'm doing this out of the kindness of my own heart. And in that note, I have started a Patreon. If you guys enjoy the content, feel free to subscribe for pennies on the dollar to keep your boy clothed. I'd appreciate if you gave that a look-see. So where to begin? This is a 2020 Kink Curb, probably one of the prettiest bikes I've seen. So kudos to you guys over there at Kink, because this bike is pretty hard. Comes in a nice toothpaste green, seafoam green. The nomenclature is not that important right now. Keep in mind, this is again an educational and informational video, so I'm not here to rag on anyone's bike. But this is an entry level bike. So if you have one at home, please do not take offense to this. This is just to explain the nuances and differences between a entry level complete bike versus a custom professional build. So for starters, we have to keep in mind that a bicycle retailing at $289 is actually an incredible feat. When I first started riding, this very bike would probably run about seven or $800. So we've come a long way, but how do we get there? Well, essentially there's always gonna be a surplus of parts from the previous models. So what bike companies have done is they strategically assemble these bikes with nice colors and some of the options that are very comparable to the custom bikes that we build, but there's minor differences. So for starters, we have the frame. Now, this geometry is going to resemble that of a custom build or an aftermarket frame. However, it'll be made out of different material. As of the last few years, high tensile steel has become very popular in the entry level bikes. It is gonna be a little less strong and a little heavier than the 4130 or Sanko Chromali that is used in a lot of the aftermarket bikes. Some of the geometries aren't gonna be as precise either because there are some savings when you come and you assemble this frame. Sometimes these rear triangles are welded from other bikes or other frames that have not been as popular in the past. Now, a lot of the savings come from the bottom bracket and the headset. As you can see here, we have an American bottom bracket and a non-integrated headset. So what does that mean? Well, the American bottom bracket is a much larger diameter bottom bracket. Traditionally, a lot of these come with unsealed bearings. So essentially the bearings are not in a sealed casing. They're just ball bearings with a cage that go into cups. The cups are then pressed into the frame. Same thing with the headset. The headset is not integrated into the frame. So it's just two cups that are banged or pressed into the frame. And then there's ball bearings and cages that go there. Now, there has been a lot of improvements with some of these high tensile steel frames, and they actually do have the 990 posts that sometimes are even removable with the higher classes of the bikes. So again, since this is an entry level bike, you're getting the bare minimum. Moving away from the frame, you'll then have the components. And one of the most costly components on a bike is your wheel set. Now these come with a semi-sealed rear wheel and a unsealed front wheel. Airplanes! I used to live near LAX, now I live near Burbank Airport. And apparently a ton of birds. Hey! Gotta switch the stance because these old knees can't take it anymore. Back to the wheels. These are unsealed wheels. They can save some money there. Also, the majority of these bikes have single walled rims, both front and rear. As you go up in price point, they'll actually add the double wall version to the rear. And then as you get even higher, they'll add the double wall version to the front. And what does that mean? Well, like it sounds, the rim will have an extra wall. So that will add more stability and integrity to that rim and it won't add a lot more weight, but it will be a lot stronger. Wheels are oftentimes one of the first things you're gonna wanna replace when you do get an entry level bike. Cranks used to come one piece for these versions. Now we have a nice set of three piece cranks. They usually come with an eight or a 16 spline spindle that's pretty heavy. So once you've upgraded your wheel set, you might wanna then upgrade your cranks. Pedals, these actually come on the majority of bikes. These might be a slightly bigger or maybe an older version of the current pedals that we have, but pedals will be pretty much the same. 
Same thing with the seat. What a lot of the bike companies have done as of 2020 is add the one piece seat. So the seat post and the seat are all one. As you upgrade your bike, you'll see that there's pivotal and tripod and even rail technology that you can use. And that makes it so you can have a lot more customization and a lot different angles on your bike. Why are you trying to get away from me? This soon at least. Moving over to the drivetrain, we have a very thin 25 tooth sprocket, but at least you have a 25 tooth. When I started, it was 44 teeth. You don't even want to begin with all the nightmares that we had with those. But the problem is that you, if you do smack up one of these sprockets up against something you're grinding, it's going to bend pretty easily and then you'll have flat or tight spots in your chain. It does feature a 14 millimeter rear axle and a nine tooth driver, so that's nice. But again, it's semi-sealed. Chain, this is going to be your pretty much run-of-the-mill $12 chain. Nothing terrible. Seat clamp, not integrated, so that means that it's an actual removable piece. And then lastly, moving to the front end, we have a forged stem. So that is essentially a block of metal, and it probably doesn't have a lot of machining. The compression bolt is actually one that pushes into the fork, and these forks are gonna be pretty heavy, but at least they do come in a nice 3 8 option. Tires, these look like some of the kink aftermarket tires and they're gonna be pretty good. The problem is that they're gonna be a little heavier and they're not gonna be rated for as high of air pressure as something you would get aftermarket. And lastly, you got the bars. These will also probably be a high tensile steel. It's gonna be a little heavier than your chromoly version. Grips, sometimes some of the companies do include either some older grips or a version that's very similar to the aftermarket ones but they never feel all that great. So that's something that if you were to get one of these bikes right off the gate, I would switch the grips at that shop. And that's it. I mean, overall, like I said, it's a really, really nice bike. Very good price point, super nice color. Kink, you did good. Oh, my knees, not so well. If you're new to this channel, I actually dropped a bike check yesterday that talks about a lot of the things about my current bike but I'm just gonna give you a couple of the quick overviews in this video comparing that complete bike. So again, aftermarket bike. If you really go and buy every single one of these parts over the counter, this bike will cost you approximately about $2,000, maybe $1,800, $1,900, I forget the exact price point. And you can still ball out and go even further, but I have more of a traditional setup, but it is very complete because it does have a gyro and four pegs and a bash guard and a heavy duty chain. As you'll see in these close-up shots, you notice that the aftermarket frames come with an integrated C-clamp. It comes with welded gussets and different tabs that add strength. And obviously when you're assembling these bikes, it takes up more time, so obviously the price will go up. The paint jobs are always a lot nicer. These are powder coated with a very durable paint that actually adheres to the metal. So it's gonna last a lot longer than the ones that come on the complete bikes. The seat and post, I currently ride the pivotal design. So that means that I can put an Allen to the very top and adjust my angle of my seat post. And it's very light and these seats are a lot better. They're triple and even quadruple stitched sometimes. So they're gonna last longer throughout these bales. Like I said, the plastic pedals are pretty similar. The Ravager pedals that I ride, a little slimmer profile, a little lighter and a little stronger, but not by much. You can still get a nicer metal pedal with a very nice sealed bearing and a chromoly spindle. So that'd be a lot stronger but pedals like that usually cost 80 or 90 bucks, while these are usually only 20 bucks. I ride a bash guard sprocket. That guard is made out of metal and it goes around and it's a slightly taller profile than the chain, so it won't actually let it hit fully. It can still touch, but not as much as the traditional impact would allow. I have the Shadow V2 interlock chain, so that's a half link chain, which is different from the $12 normal chain that's full links. It's just a much stronger heat treated design and that's another thing that the frame, fork, bars, cranks, and axles, I believe, all are heat treated. So that's a process that after they make the metal, they harden it even further. As far as the wheel set, we have the Shadow Conspiracy symbol wheel. So that's a nine tooth right hand drive for my personal riding style. They're both sealed, very strong double walls that are also very light. And the front is a three eighths female axle. So that means that the bolts actually go into the hub versus on the complete bike, they're both male axles. The rear is a 14 millimeter male axle. Comes with hub guards all around. The bars and the forks are gonna be heat treated. They're gonna be butted. So that means that the metal actually tapers down the same strength, but it'll get lighter because it's less metal. My tires are folding tires. So they're very light. They have a Kevlar bead. They have a different kind of rubber that's a lot lighter and it's actually a lot thinner, but they can hold even more air pressure. These are rated to 110 PSI. You can probably hear that. And then the aftermarket bars usually have similar buddings, 
Uh, sometimes the crossbars will be a little thinner and they'll just be overall a nicer, stronger, and lighter metal. Well, that's it guys. This is a pretty fast rundown of the overall differences between a complete bike and an aftermarket pro build. Again, there's a lot of other things that I probably did not go into full detail about because this would be a two hour video since I tend to talk a lot. Again, my bike comes with four pegs. This bike doesn't come with pegs. So all those things are things you have to keep in mind when you're building your bike. Having owned a bike shop for many years and having been sponsored by a lot of different bike companies, I learned a lot of the things that go on in the behind the scenes. So I'm here to give you some of that insider information. But if you had to ask me, Alf, what would you do if you were starting out today? I would definitely get a complete bike by one of the many BMX companies that are making amazing stuff. I would obviously lean more towards the Sabrosa brand bikes, but Kink has been making a great product. And like I said, I'm not paid to support either one of these. This is just what I've learned over the last 20 years of riding bikes and being in the BMX industry. And then if you had to ask me what price point I would start off, I would usually try and go for like a five or $600 bike. If they do have like a little more expensive option like the eight or $900 bike, those are all gonna be very close to a complete custom build. You do get price savings because you're buying all of your parts from one brand, so they can pass along some of the savings. But if you know that from the very beginning, you're down for BMX for the rest of your life, you might as well splurge a little bit at the very beginning and just build something that you want from the ground up. I literally hand built every single part on that bike except for probably the bearings that go into anything, and I didn't take the time to weld it, obviously. But maybe I should learn. What do you guys think? Should I start building my own bikes? Anyhow, that's gonna be it for me today. Make sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. Hit up my sponsors, at Sabrosa Brand and The Shadow Conspiracy. Let them know Alf sent you. And again, if you can show some support, hit my Patreon. And if you have any further questions, leave them in the comments or DM me on Instagram, at Alfredo Mancuso. All right, guys, hope you enjoy this video.